explanations uh, that may be helpful um, that aren't on the sheet, but you should have three handouts. Everybody should have three handouts. You need handouts? Handouts? If you need them, come down and get them. We've got um, the lecture outline. We've got an article from the New Yorker about um, it's by Oliver Sacks, whose book you're going to read for next Monday. And we've got a handout from Merleau-Ponty that I'll make a quick comment about. Okay? Three handouts. Handouts for the podcast viewers will be available online. <laughs> Actually, the whole course should be. This is my plan, is to have a, a website that has, among other things, courses and stuff. But when you open this course, it'll have all of the lectures. Uh, plus all of the lecture handouts and the articles and references and everything. So, you know, if you get an inkling five years from now, I'd really love to take that course again. You can just pop on over and pick it up. And it's kind of weird. I, I mean, I've been watching. Well, okay, that's another story. I've, I've been watching uh, the lectures myself. It's just a bizarre experience watching yourself generally. Um, and I thought I had something funny to say about it, but I forgot what it was. So, I won't do that. All right, so um, first, uh, Hubert Dreyfus is a philosopher at the University of California at Berkeley. He's, I don't know if he's retired, but he's close to it. He's, um, he's got to be pushing 80 years old, I guess, by this point. Um, but um, he is, he became famous actually for books and articles uh, talking about why artificial intelligence was not really, why computers could never replace human beings, I suppose is one way to put it. And he derived his critique from his understanding of existentialism, especially Heidegger and Merleau-Ponty. Anyway, uh, Dreyfus, who actually taught at Hamilton for a semester in 1999, uh, is a really, really good teacher who really understands the philosophical side of the stuff we're talking about, especially Heidegger, Merleau-Ponty. Um, he's a great teacher not because he's into son et lumière, not because he's into sort of flashy stuff, but because he can just stand up or sit at a table, which is what he usually seems to do, and just talk about one of these books. and it it all becomes clear, okay? So, I'm mentioning this because first, occasionally I, I steal things from him that I put in my own lectures. And I'm just crediting him now with a number of really cool insights and ideas and examples and so on that come up. I mean, it's not all the time, but every so often. Um, the other thing, though, is um, you can watch this guy or listen to him. So, a couple of his courses are podcast in their entirety. Um, you know, if you go to iTunes store or whatever podcast you, I don't know, I forget what it's called, but you just look up his name and you'll find them. Um, and they're quite popular internationally, actually. Uh, that one of his, his course on Heidegger was listed like number two or something on the Berkeley most popular courses list, which is an odd thing for a philosophy course. So he's very good and I recommend him. And plus, we're actually going to look at a couple of his clips. On YouTube, there are some interviews with him about Merleau-Ponty and the embodied self and Husserl and Heidegger and stuff. They're great. He's just sitting on a sofa with some interviewer. Interviewer kind of goes on too long, okay, sometimes. But, but um, Dreyfus himself will just start talking and, and it, he makes it all seem incredibly simple. It's great. And, but, but insightful, you realize, wow, that's... A, Really good idea, so I recommend it. Okay, second, Merleau-Ponty, oh, just what you need is an article from him, right? <laughs> after, after reading the preface to the Phenomenology of Perception, you probably think, this guy's impossible. Well, he's not always impossible. This, what I handed you, is actually um, a chapter from a little skinny book, only it's not really a book, called The World of Perception. It's talks that he gave on radio in France in the, I think in the 1950s. They asked him to sort of summarize his whole philosophy in a series of half a dozen or so lectures that the educated public could understand. 
Now, reading this, you'll see where the educated public in France was in the 1950s, which is not where we are, but okay. I mean, so they're good, they're serious, but it's understandable. And he's got a beautiful explanation in the chapter I gave you on the basic idea of the embodied <coughs> self. That is, that your self fundamentally starts with your physical presence in the world. And he's, he lays it out much more elegantly than I, I ever could. So I recommend it. And it's short and easy to read. Next. I made a comment in the lecture last week. Um, the point was that my body, that is, insert your name, right? your own body, is profoundly different for you than anyone else's. From anyone else's? From anyone else. Um, specifically, you're in it. <laughs> and you feel in it, for instance. And so the comment that I made was that something about, um, uh, something on the order of how I may feel sorry for you when you get sick. I mean, I do. Well, that's genuine, right? But it's a long way from me being sick. You know, and generally speaking, I'd rather you be sick than me. And it, I'm not, it's not because I'm a mean guy. I don't want you to be sick. Bless you. <laughs> I, really, I really don't. But I, and I don't mean Dan Chambliss, but any one of us, you know, there's a huge gap between pain that you feel and pain that someone else feels. So then I'm driving home, and I was thinking about this. And I, there's an exception to that, which is important because, in a sense, it's a very common exception, which is parents for their kids. You know, you'll hear sort of a cliche that a parent, if your child is really sick, you, you, I'd rather be sick, you know, myself. I'd rather have it myself than have my kid have it. Um, that's not a lie, you know. They're not making that up. That really is the case. Lots and lots of parents feel that way about their, when their children are sick. Uh, and it's just an interesting case, all right, where somehow we can get out of ourselves in a pretty serious way. Now, statistically, of course, if you think about like all the people you know and whose disease you'd want to take on yourself, it turns out they're only like two people, <laughs> but they're your children. So, Again, statistically, it's an unusual circumstance in that sense. But from another view, if you think about all parents and their kids, it's an incredibly common situation as well. So you can figure out what that means. But it's, uh, I just, I was driving home and I'm like, I left out, I mean, a major, major exception to this idea. Even though the original idea, I think, still holds, which is there's something seriously different about your personal embodied experience from anybody else's. You can't put yourself in another person's shoes in a sense. Okay? All right. Now, uh, let me speak just for a moment about a philosophical issue that underlies a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about for the past few weeks and will for the next two weeks. Okay? And it is <clears throat> Cartesian dualism. All right, nice snappy phrase you can use to impress your friends. Caveat, I'm not a philosopher, huh? Okay, but I'm a pretty well-educated guy who knows a little about this stuff. We are using the issues described here for our own purposes, you know, a social science course, right? To enlighten us and make us think differently about the self and how we fit into society and so on. But I'm just giving you a very general introduction to an important idea in philosophy. All right. There was a French philosopher. His name was René Descartes. So you don't say, you don't pronounce the S's in France. Right? Okay. René Descartes. He was really smart. You may have heard of him before. <laughs> like if you ever did geometry, for instance. Okay, Cartesian coordinates, you know what Cartesian coordinates are, you know, x, y axis, this kind of thing. We'll get back to that, actually. René Descartes, very important philosopher, 1598 to 1650, I believe. That's when he lived, I believe. Okay, 
His name was Descartes, which literally means of the cards, you know, like playing cards. So they tend to drop the the preposition when you're describe when you're using it as an adjective. Cartesian dualism. All right. This is the notion which Descartes didn't invent, but he formalized it in a way that really stuck with us, us, like all of us pretty much, which tells you how influential this philosopher was, that there's a mind and there's a body. And they're two totally different kinds of things. Right? So most of us just kind of automatically understand, let's say, or accept the notion that we have a body, yeah, yeah, you know, okay, it's a physical thing, right? And we have a mind, which is not the same as our brain. It's a different kind of thing. It's not clear where it exists, okay? But there's something going on here, and then there's the stuff that's going on here, okay? Cartesian dualism so Descartes thinks about things for a while, and he says, well, there's a mind and there's a body. And you go like, oh, wait, they're like two different things. Uh, how do we get them together? So your mind, presumably, can think all sorts of things, right? And can have wacky ideas and free will <coughs> and can cook up new ways of doing stuff and think, I could go over here and do this. I could go do that. And then somehow when your mind wants to do something, like pick up your arm, I can say, okay, arm, pick up. <laughs> totally cool, right? I don't know how that happened. Now, I mean, nowadays we sort of know there's some you know, chemical gets secreted. Well, what started that? My mind. Uh, okay. So philosophers have been plagued by this problem ever since Descartes. So have a lot of other people. The people we're dealing with that is the existentialists, right? Phenomenological existentialists of the mid 20th century. Heidegger, Sartre, Merleau-Ponty, those guys tried to figure out a solution to that problem. Okay, that's a lot of what's going on. So, what we've been talking about in the last few lectures and discussions are various angles on solving that problem, on saying how do they actually go together? So there's the mind, all right? And for Sartre, of course, he, uh, he kind of labels that part of human existence, what he calls the poor squaw in French, which means the, um, the for itself. You'll run across this in the reading next, in the next week. No, no, I mean not the one coming right up, but right after that, the for itself. In other words, that part of ourselves that can kind of go anywhere, or think new ideas, or jump out ahead, or have freedom. <coughs> Right? There's freedom, you know. Right? And then there's the other part, which Sartre refers to the body and our physical reality, not just of people, but of objects. He calls that the en soi, the in itself. All right? So, I'm hoping not to confuse you by throwing out too many of these terms too fast, but basically it's this mind versus body kind of thing. And how do you reconcile them? How do they fit together? And what we saw last time in the Goffman discussion is that there's also what we might call society, just for shorthand right now, other people. And that's all, they're impinging on all this stuff all the time, right? They're influencing the way we think. They're influencing how we act. They're responding to our physical attributes and actions. All right. Okay, so far. Now, let's go back and get on our lecture track, having hit you with some, like, big, general, weird, abstract stuff. Let's go back to our concrete things and little stories and stuff. Right? And along the way, you'll start seeing these things folding into each other. Make sense? Did you like the Gotham stuff last week? Face work, that's okay? Yeah? okay? So they're people, they're dealing with each other. We're trying to figure out, through all of this, of course, we're trying to figure out what it means to say you have a self. And what does the self consist in? And how does it operate? So, okay. So, uh, to start off today, 
I'm going to use a bunch of different words in various ways, kind of helpful uh, heuristic devices to pry open some ideas and stuff. Don't worry about memorizing the words or any of that. That doesn't matter. Second, this is not a logical argument I'm laying out here. Uh, or it's, huh, let me rephrase that. I think it's logical, but it's not presented in, in a sequence of logic, okay? It's not presented as A, B, C that follows clearly. What we're trying to do is get kind of a vision, almost, of how people live. If you look at one's lived reality, how is it shaped? And what affects it? And what's it like, okay? So, follow along, hang in with each step along the way, and like I say, within, well, by the time we get to the midterm exam, in fact, on the midterm exam, you, yourselves, will pull this all together and make this marvelous logical package of the whole thing. Okay? All right. Last time, I mean, that is a week ago, we, were, we started saying, what's, what is the self? All right. Be simple. Okay. First, first thing I know about my self is I have a body. Okay? I'm physically here. That's crucial. Without, I'm sine qua non, right? Without which nothing. You got to have a physical body. And that's the only means you have of being a self, of being a person. And it's peculiar to you. That is, the oddities of the way you're built affect everything you can do and how other people respond to you and so on. Right. Okay, second, <clears throat> the body is really important to who, to, to my idea of myself and to how I feel about things all the time. Uh, a lot of little hints to this, and it comes out in a lot of ways. One of which is that um, I'm most conscious of being here, you might say, when the body is threatened. Right? So, you know, for me it's like getting bee stings. From when I was a kid, I had this thing about getting stung by bees. It turns out, I'm just irrelevant side note. Um, it apparent, I apparently actually chemically attract yellow jackets. Uh, this is not good. Um, <laughs> it's been a problem since I was a little kid. I'm a, I was allergic to bee stings when I was a kid. Like, you know, I had to take special pills and all this. All right. And was terrified of the things. Uh, my wife thought I was just like making this up. And. Um, I mean, not, not the part about being scared, but she said, relax, you'll be fine, they just don't bother them, they won't bother you. Until she started walking around the garden with me and discovering like, geez, I mean, you know, what's with you? You're attracting these things. I go, well, I tried to tell you that. Anyway, um, that's not really relevant, is it? <laughs> no. but, if you're, but if you're threatened that way, if you're ill, uh, if you're physically afraid of your situation, um, all of that heightens your awareness, right? You get pumped up, so to speak. You get a little adrenaline rush, and you're, you're aware of where you are and what's happening and so on. Some people really like this. Um, so one of the attractions for some fair number of people of being in the military, uh, there are guys who like combat, who like not that they want to get shot, right? Not that everything's pleasant about it, no, not at all. But there is definitely uh, a rush involved, right, to knowing that somebody else is shooting at you, for instance. And there are guys who, I used to take Soldier of Fortune magazine, which is a magazine for mercenaries. Actually, I don't know if it exists anymore, but it was really big in the 70s and 80s. Um, I guess you're not going to ask why I subscribe to Soldier of Fortune magazine. <laughs> Anyway, it was pretty interesting. But they, uh, they have ads in the back for mercenaries because there are guys who just like being in actual shoot, shoot, bang, bang kind of stuff, right? Because it makes you feel it's really intense, okay? You pro folks probably get something like that in a big sporting event, let's say. If you're an athlete, you could get that sort of thrill like, wow, this is it, it's all on the line, you know, it's the last 30 seconds, you know, I got to take the shot, that kind of thing, okay? But it's physically involving, that's the point. That's the point. So your body, you know, is your connection with that feeling of being, of being alive. Um, sex and violence, we talk about sex and violence in movies. People get worked up over there's too much sex and violence in movies. 
the reason that there's a lot of sex and violence in movies is those are activities that compel your attention, right? Because they involve your body in its most excitable states. When it's most geared up, when you're physically most engaged. And that draws people's attention in a big way. Okay. Um, second, so, so first point there would be, if we want to, I don't know, is that your body's important to who you are. That makes sense. And you can see that in, in episodes in which that intensity of physical feeling is heightened. All right, second thing is that um, having a body or being, being in a, I mean, that's awkward, isn't it? You don't exactly have a body. I mean, from other people's <coughs> point of view, you do. Because they know there's some kind of animating force inside this physical object, and the object moves. <laughs> Must be alive. But from your own point of view, it's that you, you just are this physical, this physical presence, right? Uh, well, you're, yeah, your physical presence. So present is an interesting word. Um, because, I mean, it, it has multiple meanings, and most of them are probably relevant here, actually. Uh, you're present in your body in the sense of being not just physically here, but you're also socially here. This is Goffman's point, right? Goffman says, any time a person enters an encounter with other people, their self is, at je is in jeopardy. Right? That's what the face work essay is all about, is any time you're physically with other people, Bad stuff can happen. That's just biological, but Goffman talks about it as a social problem. That is, how do you deal with other people? How do you trick them into thinking you're a certain kind of person or not? But there's that vulnerability thing that's always there. And, and just most generally, it means that if you're physically on a scene anywhere in the world, you can do stuff, which is to say you can screw up. You can not only accomplish positive things, but you can mess things up in a big way. And you're getting to be the age where people will take that seriously. It's going to be on your permanent record, <laughs> right, from here on. So there's something about, well, when you're, a, you know, when you're a child, it kind of doesn't count, a lot of things. This is good, by the way. I'm, you should be glad of this. And you're in college, and you're probably like, well, if I'm in college, it probably doesn't really count a lot of stuff. Right? It's good. But what it means to be, to be an adult is that all of a sudden the stuff you do or don't do, right, because that's acting too, counts. Right? So, I don't know, your best friend winds up in the hospital and you don't go visit. That counts. <laughs> all right? So a lot of what Sartre talks about, by the way, hint for, the, for two weeks down the road from here, a lot of what Sartre's philosophy is about is how we hide from that responsibility. That is, you're alive in the world, you're free to do all sorts of stuff, but you're also not free not to do anything. Or as Sartre says, you're, you're condemned to be, to be free. <coughs> you're condemned to be free. That's, that's his, the, the heart, the, his philosophy in a nutshell, if you want it, is you're condemned to be free. That's Sartre. Okay. So, got to do stuff, happening all the time, no escape from it. And a lot of his, the neat stuff in his philosophy in being in nothingness, which we'll read a little excerpt from on bad faith, is that people spend a tremendous amount of time and effort convincing themselves that they're not free. Ah. And at that point, gang, we start getting into sociology in a big way. That will introduce, in effect, the second half of the course, which is, you know, it's self in society. Right? And it turns out that society helps us in lots and lots of ways feel that we're not responsible for what we do. So if you wanted to read the rest of Beyond Caring, that's what that book is really about is how those nurses, for instance, 
live and organize themselves in such a way that they can be involved in bad stuff sometimes and not feel guilty. Okay? All right. So, let's talk about the features of the embodied self. What I've got here on your outline says, two features of an embodied self, action plus passion or active and passive. I don't know. I just made that up. You know, they're just words. Don't worry about them. Like there, but there's an active side and a passive side. And I was kind of playing with the language to see where it got us. All right. On the one hand, because you're embodied, you can act. You can do things. You can create. You can create stuff in the world, not just by like making a sculpture or something. It just doesn't mean creation in that sense. But it means creation in the sense of you can do stuff that never happened before. Or I, I love, I like dance. Okay, I think it's kind of cool. I, I don't mean I'm a big, what's the word? I'm an aficionado. What do they call it? What do you call a person who's in, who goes to dance? What? Huh? Master, there's a, well, there's a, and there's some special term for somebody who, God, there is, I'm sure there is, who just likes watching ballet and stuff like that. Well, the funny thing about dance is that once, it, or all sorts of performing arts actually, they're, they're done, they're gone, okay? Right? So somebody does, Voo, you know, like this, and that was it. That was the big moment, okay? You missed it if you didn't see it. And you go, wow, that was fabulous. And then it kind of fades away, you know, like the fog evaporating or something, just like a mist. It just disappeared, right? And that's kind of a nice symbol for what human life is like, see? Which is part of the reason dance has a certain appeal. Okay, well, that's, that's just a metaphor, but, you know, you wave your hand and it's, you know, and it's gone. Um, but you can create all sorts of things. You can create situations. You can create values in the world. You can decide, for instance, that golf is incredibly important, and you can devote your life to golf. And your life then becomes a testament, as Sartre said, right? A statement of the value of golf. Okay. You can create more serious note. Um, when, when uh, huh, okay, oh, God forbid, somebody, somebody close to you dies, right? And you react, or somebody not close to you dies. I don't know. Y'all remember when um, Princess Diana died? Were you? How old were you folks? Was that like eight or ten or something? I mean, you were little kids, right? Okay. So, you know who I mean? Yeah. <coughs> Diana? Yeah. She's like married to Charles, who's. You were like five, is that right? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Well, when it happened, this was big stuff. I mean, there were people all over the world like, ha, 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 ha. Right? Big deal. This person died. She was a public celebrity. Okay? People had followed her life and stuff. But they emoted a lot of grief over the death of this person they didn't know. Which is fine, okay? I'm not knocking this. But, but if somebody you know, let's say, dies, your own, okay, your own grief, this is very sorry, <coughs> by the way, what I'm about to say. Your own grief is a statement of your relationship to that person. Okay? That what you do when you grieve for a person is you kind of announce how important they were to you. Which is odd. Because a lot of times your reactions aren't what you would think they would be. And sometimes you might get very upset, and you see this again, you know, in celebrity stuff. You see somebody gets way over, you know, like, oh my God, this horrible thing happened. Well, yeah, it's horrible, but you didn't actually know that person, right? You know, like, what's that about? Well, I don't know what it's about. I'm not making any declaration there. But, but you get the most, um, you know, there's this, this kind of effort almost to convince yourself that you really did care about that person. That could be part of it. Or that you're making a statement of the kind of person you are in your grief. I'm not saying this is deliberate. Sartre certainly did. No, no, the point is not that this is something you sit there and figure out and say, I'm going to announce that I really care about such and such. That's why I was upset when this thing happened. That's not the point. It's just there. It's just who you are in some sense, right? That you've got this existential kind of connection of some sort to this other person. And again, I got no answers at all on this issue for any particular case. But, 
but there is something there in the way that grief declares that person's value. Declares that person's value. Uh, yeah, I'll give you another example. You, objects. All right. So um, you, you create value through objects. And we can talk about, i got teddy bears written down here. I don't know why. But mm -hmm. teddy bears are some kind of symbol for a lot of people. So whenever there's like a public tragedy of some sort, you know, people put teddy bears, you know, at the site. Have you noticed this? I don't know. I mean, we could talk about where, why teddy bears and where that came from and what it means, but, but there's some sort of, um, I mean, there's a statement being made of some sort. Well, that was, I'm not really going anywhere with that, am I? All right. Well, I told you the money thing already. We talked about that, right? I pull out a bill? Have I done? Have I pulled out a bill in here? Yeah, I did that trick. <laughs> it's a cheap trick. It is. It's totally pandering. But, but why you feel like there's value in money is something we can explore, and in fact will, when we start talking about ritual solidarity and things of that sort, and the way money gets passed back and forth and gets used in certain ways, and then you come to evaluate it as somehow having some intrinsic value in itself. All right. Now, the, the Sartrean argument, which is probably not Merleau-Ponty's, is that you can kind of willy-nilly give value to anything. Right? You can just arbitrarily decide golf is valuable, or TV is valuable, or Princess Diana you know, is valuable, or something. <coughs> I don't know. It's an empirical question how much that's true. Can you just decide not to care about something that's been important? Um, so, um, when I moved in, when I came to Hamilton College 31 years ago, I was moving into a little apartment down on College Street, and uh, a senior faculty member here, who was a very nice fellow, has retired now, uh, offered to help me move in, which is very generous. So he comes down, I got this rental car, you know, rental truck with the, oh God, everything I own, which wasn't that much, and you know, some old mattress. And stuff. And he comes down and he helps me start moving in all the boxes. Right? And, he's pull and he pulls out this one box. And uh, I said, be careful with that box. Right? I said, That's, that is actually the, probably the single most valuable thing I own. And in this box, you know, we opened it up and I showed him, is this, um, <laughs> it was a mug from the 1964 World's Fair in New York City. Uh, that was, it was this immense bowl kind of coffee mug that said, I was a coffee hound at the New York City World's Fair. And it had like, you know, le levels inside that mark whether you were, you know, a real coffee hound or somebody who had a big mug. And it, this had belonged to my uh, advisor, my college advisor, who was actually quite a close friend. And she gave this to me when I finished college, you know. So this is like this prize possession kind of thing, you know. And so I said, so yeah, and be careful with the box. No sooner than I said this, than the guy dropped it. I mean, immediately. It was like I, I willed it to happen or something. I said, don't drop it. Okay? And so suddenly for an instant there, I'm like, I'm poised on the edge of, you know, the razor. <laughs> okay, I'm brand new here. Here's this nice, evidently nice person who's generously helping me move all my stuff and he doesn't know me from anybody. And he drops and breaks. I mean, the thing shattered. What was, I'm not close to things generally, but you know, this was pretty much the most valuable thing. I, and it took me probably three-tenths of a second, okay, to make that decision, which was to, to sort of laugh, oh, no big deal, no, you know, whatever, you know, like that, and act like it was no big deal. And in effect, I decided that it was no big deal. I wasn't faking it, right? I, and I'm, I'm not offering this as any model behavior or anything. I'm just saying it was kind of weird because at that moment in my life, I sort of decided that no object was going to be very important to me. No physical object would be more important than hurting the feelings, basically, of this guy. Because he was like, oh, shoot. And I'm like, oh, don't worry. Right? 
And it's true. I, I, don't know, I can't think of a thing, you know, of any physical object. I, I'm not counting people or cats or anything like that, but, you know, that's different. But, but no physical object was just going to be important to me. It was just kind of a decision. And it just happened. I don't know. It just happened. So that's what you kind of do. So um, you, can create all, you can create other people socially, too. Right? So we've already talked before. I think I've described to you about creating your professors, you know, or making them better. Can you talk about that? Oh, yeah. You can make your professors better. I mean, I don't mean like a huge way. But the way you respond in class has an immediate effect on, say, what I do. There's no, no doubt about it. Right? So if you're really following and you look more interested when I say certain things or less or, you know, you ha -ha, laugh the jokes, that kind of stuff, that feeds the beast. I mean, you know, <laughs> that's kind of, right, right. See, I go, oh, oh, okay, you know. Then I get a little more confident and then, you know, if there's anything good in there, it's more likely to come out. Well, you do that with other people all the time, too. Right? You allow them for instance, to be nice. We've talked about that before. And you can really, really do that, actually, by, by pointing out the places where they are nice and feeding that, right? Or where they're funny or where they say something interesting and stuff, which is actually a lot of what teaching is about, is figuring out when students are really on to something and then say, wow, expand on that. And, you know, next thing you know, this big, glorious thing happens. Okay, let's go. That's good. But with other people, you can do this. So, um, um, in, uh, when I was in seventh, eighth grade, I took dancing, ballroom dancing, with Margaret Howell. That was her name. She's gone on to her reward now, so I can talk freely about her. She was lovely. She was a wonderful lady. This is in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Ballroom dance. Everybody, basically, in our crowd had to do this. You know, the schools I went to and stuff go every week, an hour every week, and learn how to walk across the floor. Hi, may I have this dance? Oh, it was more like, hi, may I have this dance? Because <laughs> you know, the girls are up here, and so whatever. So. And we'd learn how to, you know, do different things. And uh, Mrs. Howell had, um, I was not involved in this, but, um, uh, well, uh, yeah. with her, a couple of her older students, uh, there was a, as she would say, there was a young lady in her class who basically couldn't get a date to the dances, right? The guys just didn't go, you know, whatever. And she wasn't particularly attractive and so on. Anyway, Mrs. Howe was kind of always covering for people, right? So she'd call up and say, oh, hi, uh, Mr. Chambliss. I was wondering, uh, I have a young lady who's, you know, needs an escort for the cotillion. You know, kind of, okay, Mrs. Howe. So, um, there was this situation, and she described this to one of the boys in one of her classes. These were high school kids, older than I was. And, um, well, as it happened, the guy got together with three of his friends and decided this girl was going to go to every high school dance that year. They just kind of decided. And there were these dances like once a month or something. And they just decided to do it. So he calls her up the first time, and she girl, I, Mrs. Hal told us this story, okay? I, I'm not vouching for it, I'm just using it as an example. He calls her up and says, would you like to go? And the girl was kind of stunned, and, uh, okay, you know, so they went to the dance, right? And then a month later, the next guy calls her up, and the girl was apparently a little less stunned, and uh, he goes to pick her up, and she's kind of, you know, done up in different kind of hairstyle and stuff. And the third guy calls up. She wasn't surprised, apparently, and, you know, they just went to the dance. And the fourth guy calls her up. The fourth month, she already had another date. <laughs> okay? Because along the way, what happened is basically her confidence started going up, and she started, you know, paying a little more attention to this thing and that thing. Becomes a little more outgoing, a little more ha-ha-ha, you know. Da -da 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 -da. <laughs> Next thing you know, she's popular. <laughs> Right? And they basically created a popular girl. Right? So you can actually do, I mean, there are limits, obviously, but you can do that sort of thing. It works. It really works. Who you hang out with makes a huge difference. Right? So if you're, if you're feeling miserable, check out who you're spending time with, because that's a big factor. Okay. Um, even, yeah, you create your own self by how you spend your time, what you're doing. And I, told my daughter when she went to college, I said, just remember nobody ever became famous or happy or successful or fell in love by watching TV. Okay? 
It's just not likely. It's, it's a waste of time. I mean, I like watching TV, but it's not going to improve your life. Whereas, hanging out with the right people will, in big ways. And just, just if you want the, the quick preview of this book that Chris Takis and I are writing about college, uh, which should come out next fall, all right, uh, the key is who you spend time with. That's the whole thing. Forget about coursework. And, I mean, don't forget about coursework. But <laughs> it's, it's not about what your major is or what courses you take or, you know, any of that, or even what extracurriculars you're in or any of that business. Don't worry about that. It, look for the people, okay, and ask yourself, who are the actual people involved in this thing or this thing or this thing? It's, a, it's who you spend time with. I'm just telling you. So I'm a... I'm a highly trained social scientist, okay? And that's my, that's a big thing. <laughs> okay. Um, but you create yourself in all those social ways. You actually create yourself just in, in sheer physical ways, obviously, too. I mean, like, you know, this is Cheez-Its, and uh, uh, this is like Sour Patch Kids, right? You're just uh, doing this. You're making yourself. You are what you eat. You're <laughs> You've never heard that expression? You are what you eat? Man ist was man ist. Something, I think it's Goethe said that maybe. Yeah, it's a famous old saying. It works. It works. Okay, so anyway, so the body is active and we're doing stuff and we can create things, right? We can create other people, create relationships, create objects as important or not, make things relevant or not. You've got the freedom to do all that. It's really quite amazing if you take advantage of it. Okay, on the other hand, being embodied, um, um, also, th so those are all active elements of having a body. Things you can do with your physical self that make things happen in the world. There's, so there's creation, right? The other side of it is what I uh, think of sometimes as, as passion, um, which is a tricky word. But among other things, it means your body has a passive side to it. That is, you're, you're here as an object. And so stuff can happen to you. Not all of which is good, uh, but there's, there's, uh, well, okay, slow down, Dan, think about it, okay. This refers to passion, this refers to the idea that the body is alive, but might not be taking the initiative, so to speak, like stuff can happen to it, and that's a big part of our experience as well. So, obviously, um, uh, you know, when you say passion, you think of lust. Well, the nice, I mean, not the only, but one of the nice things about lust is you kind of feel caught up by it, like you're not exactly passive, but just, let's say, swept along, <laughs> right? That I'm, I'm just at the mercy of my emotions, <laughs> this kind of thing, right? And when it's good, that's really good. And you sort of like, oh, there's something nice. It's like surfing or something, sort of. <laughs> I mean, like, oh, you catch a wave. That's what I meant, right? So the timing is just right, and it works perfectly, and there you are just falling down. Oh, see, that's good. That's good. Um, there's also passion in the sense of, uh, say, a crime of passion, we say, is a crime committed by, the, by a person who feels like they had no control over what they were doing. Now, there's a great book on the subject called uh, the Seductions of Crime by a guy named Jack Katz, who is, who is a phenomenological sociologist. I mean, he proudly wears the label. And there's a great section. The first chapter is called Righteous Slaughter. And it's about family murders, which is the way most murders happen, actually. Um, is somebody walks in on their spouse in bed with somebody else, for instance, and goes, ah! They run in the next room, grab the gun, come back, boom! And they're like, and then they call the police and say, I just killed my husband or wife, right? Not at all a rare situation. But what's interesting is the way that people who do this describe what happened as that I was carried away, right? I lost control of myself. I didn't know what happened. It just happened to me. And yet you realize, of course, the problem with that <coughs> is well, nobody else was in charge, right? And Katz, in describing this, talks about how people construct uh -huh, their definition of the situation, 
right? So that they have no choice. Okay? In other words, they, they almost designedly see things in a way that requires them to act the way they did. Okay? And it's, it's a really marvelous chapter. You ought to read it sometime just for... Well, fun's not exactly the right word, but it's it's very enlightening sort of um, sort of thing. Okay, passion also can refer, you know, religiously speaking, it's it's the um, suffering of Christ leading up to the crucifixion. Okay, that is the day and a half or whatever before Jesus was killed um, is is in Catholicism especially is referred to as the passion. The idea there being, what's important about it, why it's capitalized and all, is that here's the, the whole idea of Christ, of Christianity, is that God becomes a human being, which doesn't compute, right? And it's not like that, that's not the way God works. And so the passion is kind of this symbolic statement of uh, the idea that well, Jesus is the wrong word, that Christ uh, picked up humanity for a while and was human, and that which fundamentally means was able to suffer the sort of thing human beings are able to suffer, which is to say, here we are, right? I'm embodied. I'm not God like some little mind, you know, floating up out there in the nowheres. It's right here and right now. Okay? Okie dokes. Let's, let's go on. So, if, if acting in the world through your body is creation and can be doing stuff, you can do stuff, this other side, this passion business, uh, I've also thought of as kind of robbery, by which I mean you can be robbed. So this is what Goffman describes in, in a lot of ways, is that because you're here and you're physically available, you do stuff, bad things can happen to you, but people can also misunderstand what you do. So you try to do something, and it's, it's misappropriated by others. It's misappropriated. Great example would be this class. So I'm... T <laughs> this doesn't matter. Okay. Some people might say, this class is nothing but, like, dirty stories. <laughs> you know, shambles. Oh, it told us that story about going to the swimming pool, you know? <laughs> ah, oh, told, oh, told us about the bathtub story. Oh, Magnolia Blanc, hoo -hoo. <laughs> right? I'm like, you guys don't understand. This is serious stuff here. <laughs> See, that's what I want to say. But you could, you could, you know, one could misread all of this, right? And I'm scared. I mean, one thing about this podcast is I'm terrified. Some, some clip gets taken out of context and my career is ruined. <laughs> You know, somebody posts something on YouTube, and next thing you know, I don't know, Rick Perry comes after me or something. He's like, I don't know, this is what college education is. <laughs> $50,000 a year for our kids to hear bathtub stories. Like, it'd be a bad scene. But it happens. You know, stuff. People can take, you know, what you're trying to do or your, what you intend and run away with it. So... Um, there I was, you know, 30-something years ago. I was in love with this woman, right? I'm seeing her a lot. It was great. And one day I come up to her in the kitchen and I start singing. You know, like, I forget the song. And she says, who told you you could sing? <laughs> right? It was terrible. Now, the relationship was very good in lots of other ways, okay? But just that, that, and I think she was in a, she had had a bad day or something, right? But in that moment, there was like, whoa, this was a beautiful gift, you understand? I don't do this for everybody. <laughs> right? But it gets misinterpreted, and that, that stuff happens all the time. I mentioned earlier in the course, you know, the idea that you, you smile at somebody or you try to be nice and they think you're patronizing them. You say, oh, you feeling better today? I'm fine, thanks. Sorry. Right? So even your efforts to be good can, you know, politicians deal with this sort of stuff all the time. They're, they're trying to make some point. They get quoted out of context. I don't have that much sympathy for them. But, but they're in that mode where they have to constantly be on guard about exactly what they're doing and saying. 
so that nothing can be misread in, or misread in a way they don't want it to be. Okay? And so you get in this whole Goffmanian presentation of self thing where you're judging everything that you do in advance, trying to avoid what I've called robbery, right? Or having people misinterpret what you're doing. Now that uh, there are all I've just listed various examples here, I, I see, but um, one of them that really gets me is uh, uh, like artworks. So I don't know, did Vincent Van Gogh, you know, when he's, he's miserable and he's painting away and stuff. Do you ever think somebody would sell one of his paintings for $50 million? I mean, we, I don't know. I don't know if he'd be pleased at that, you know, or he'd look at some hedge fund manager and say, I don't think you really understand this painting. <laughs> You're just you're doing something else, right? There's, I mean, it's okay to be doing it, and artists might like making money, I'm sure. But, but the idea that there's this thing that you invest your life in, and then other people see it as something totally, totally different, that would that could be kind of disturbing. There was a, a, a um, program on radio a few years back. It was I forget the name. It was something like Book World, and I heard about oh, book, yeah, yeah. I read, you know, I write books. Oh. Book world. Now they'll talk about books. And I turn on, and it turned out what they were talking about is like old, old books, 1780 or something kind of books, and how much you could sell them for. I'm like, I don't think Descartes had that in mind. You might, you might think, boy, you know, 400 years from now, they'll be selling this for a lot. That's not what he was doing, right? And that's not what he was trying to. That wasn't the role he wanted to have in the world, was that, you know, many years later, various East Side lawyers would be swapping his books for thousands of dollars or something. It's kind of weird. It's kind of weird. And obviously, I mean, this is why the Frankenstein story is it's kind of a classic of the genre, right? Having children is a classic of the genre. <laughs> right? You find some nice person, you know, you get married, you decide you're going to have a family. You have kids, you pour your heart and soul into them, they turn out badly. <laughs> they blame you. I mean, that happens to people, right? It's not uncommon at all. Or they, you know, they start doing stuff that you really don't approve of or you're embarrassed by, or then they s swipe at you. And, right? That's it. That's kind of creation and robbery, right? You try to do something in the world, and yet there you are. You're vulnerable, and you don't really have a control over how it plays out. Right? And you try to do original stuff and it gets eaten up. So so there's uh, you ever see these dancing school crossing guards? You ever, you, do you know what I'm talking about at all? Does this ring? No? Okay. All right. So this happened first time I realized this was thirty years ago. There was this woman, this was in Chattanooga when I was living there, and she was out in front of an elementary school, the, and it was a complicated intersection. And she didn't just direct traffic, you know, for the kids like this. She would be like, <laughs> right? I mean, she was really into this thing. It was kind of glamorous. Wow, that's so cool. And so the newspaper came out and they took all these pictures and they ran this series of pictures, you know, so in, you know, North Chattanooga's dancing school guard. People go, wow, that's fabulous, right? And it was. And then a few years later, I was living in Connecticut, and one day I opened up the newspaper, and they got a series of pictures of a dancing school crossing guard. <laughs> like it's a thing now. And various people did it, right? So what did a, you know, and I don't think they got it from the one in Chattanooga. I think, you know, people spontaneously come up with this or whatnot. But it becomes like an item. When Jean-Paul Sartre, right? He uh, wrote these novels and things before he did the philosophy, and he won the Nobel Prize. Right? Big deal. Very big deal. But Sartre was this like staunch individualist. You know, he's not going to get sucked into social convention and that sort of business. So he, he refused the Nobel Prize. Okay? He turned it down. And you know what? Then on the back cover of his books, they'd say, he refused the Nobel Prize. <laughs> he's still there. He can't escape it, right? Once they had him pegged, as it were, he can't just say, no, nope, sorry, I'm not going to do it. Then he becomes, oh, he's one of those guys who refuses the prize. 
You know, like that's a thing that you just do. That's a way, that's just another way of being a famous author in a form that people then start recognizing. And a lot of the existentialists, Heidegger and, and uh, Sartre and all these guys, lots of said that I'm not an existentialist. I'm not an existentialist. Because it got to be kind of a fad, so to speak, and they didn't want to be part of it. But they were. Everybody knows, oh, he too denied being an existentialist. Yeah, yeah. Got here a comment. Even revolutions get fought by the rules. You know how to have a protest, right? How do, I don't know. How do y'all have protests? If you had a protest, what would you do? What would you do? Signs. Pardon? Put up signs. Put up signs. What else? Sets of fire. <laughs> <laughs> now there's a creative protest leader. <laughs> right? You have a future. <laughs> well, people, you know, people do certain things, right? There's so you have a petition, maybe. I don't know. What else would you do? You have a petition. You have a mar Oh, a candlelight vigil. <laughs> Perfect. You can have a candlelight vigil. Those are always good. You can set one's self on fire. Uh, yeah, have people done that? People have done that. Set their cells on fire? That's what happened in Tunisia. <laughs> set off. But that what, that's right. That's where it came from. Is The Vietnamese, the Buddhist monks in Vietnam did it. And it worked. It's kind of a high commitment. <laughs> I mean, you know. He took like a chance, though. Huh? He took like a chance. He just stood there and didn't move. He burned death. Very powerful. But people <laughs> recognize what it is, right? I mean, if you made a list of all the human things one could do to protest, like setting yourself on fire wouldn't just jump to mind spontaneously, <laughs> right? But people kind of know there are set things that you do, even when the whole point is to overthrow the social order. Right? There are conventional ways of doing things, even when you're trying to be unconventional. I mean, this you know, easy example is you go back to high school, right? They're the kids who are going to be the rebels, or the, I don't know what you call them, but you know, oh, those are, the, those are the kids who reject convention. <laughs> and they do it in totally conventional ways, right? It's not, you, and it's, it's not that there's anything wrong with that, it's just kind of the way social life seems to work. Okay. All right. Let me finish this up here. You, this robbery thing. Okay, so what I'm trying to project, let me see if I can make the general point here. Yeah, we're free. We can do stuff. We can create. But even those efforts tend rather rapidly to get reabsorbed into what we might call the typified social world. All right? It becomes a type of activity. Other people and ourselves classify it and say, oh, it's one of those. It's not, it's not going to keep its unique spirit for very long, in other words. All right? So one day, you know, I'm walking well, on the road to Damascus, would be the example, right? And God speaks to me. Hmm? Like God speaks to me. Right. This is a very big deal. Huh? Okay, it doesn't happen all the time. Okay, God speaks. So I'm all excited about this, and I change my name and stuff, and I go and I tell people, God spoke to me. I'm like, no kidding. Great. <laughs> right? And maybe I convince some of them that God really did speak to me. But, you know, it loses something in the translation. Like, they didn't actually talk to God themselves. And so then I start writing about it, and they start writing about it, and we spread this. Next thing you know, there are millions of people around the world all talking about this, and, you know, this religion really takes off and goes someplace. But somewhere along the line, the uniqueness of that experience gets lost. That's the point. And recovering that can be quite difficult. All right? We get absorbed kind of into the, Max Weber called this the routinization of charisma, by the way. The idea that routine, again, right, right we talked about routine a little bit, reabsorbs the unique stuff that, that tends to go on. So it's very hard to keep, to keep hold of the, uh, the lived reality of our own lives. Okay, I say here, we even rob our own selves. Uh, Let's see. Well, I'll, I'll give you a couple of things I'm 
so a couple of instances I'm thinking of. Let's see if this makes sense. Um, when I was th three years old, four years old, we uh, we had a car. When I was this, this, this was like 1957 or something. Uh, we had this old green Pontiac, a car model that no longer exists. And one day, I was quite young. One day, my parents decided they were getting a new car. Yeah? So they got a new car. But I remember when, when my father like takes the old car to drive it away, I started crying. You know? Because like, <laughs> it's, our, it's our car. <laughs> right? And it was, I mean, it's just this car, but, but I was attached to it. Okay, so then I got a little older and I thought that was the stupidest thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> I got uh, yeah, a little kid crying because of a car. And now that I'm the age I am now, I look at it and I go, no, you've got to respect that, right? But there was a certain point at which I sort of denigrated my own past, right? That I was, I was trying to say I'm not that little kid anymore. That's the point. The more serious example is when I was 11 um, and I had a big, beautiful cat. Uh, flame point kind of you know, cat uh, It was great, named Sam. Sam was swell, except Sam had a bad habit of going down to the river <laughs> near where we live and bringing back rats. So one day my little brother saw one of the rats in the front yard, Sam had been playing, and went over and decided to pick it up. So he got chomped, you know, well, okay, you can see where this is going. Not good news for Sam, <laughs> that's where it's going. Anyway, the upshot is my parents sent Sam to the farm, <laughs> and I'm, you know, I'm lying there <laughs> crying my eyes out for two nights. And my mom comes in and says, my parents were real sweet about all this, but I mean, the cat had to go. But for some years after, you know, like when I got older and stuff, I'm like, that was kind of silly. I mean, it's just a cat, right? which is not the way I think about it now at all. So now I'm like, well... I don't know if I'd respond that way today, but there's something that's got to be respected about the child's view of the world, right? You know, it's not a, it's not a disreputable thing or something that you grow out of like it's a good, like it's a good move. Um, yeah. Anyway, so so what happened is that at a certain point in my life, I'd look back at those instances and say, "Oh, that was silly," and I was kind of robbing from myself. I was kind of robbing from my own childhood in that, and not appreciating what was going on there. And not appreciating what was going on there, yeah. And it's tough because, so, so if you think about yourself, you try, like, you write a college application essay. This would be a good example. Oh, that's hard. You know, and you're supposed to, I don't know if you did this for Hamilton, if they have you do this, but you're supposed to write something of showing how unique and special you are. <laughs> good luck. You can't, I mean, it's like, be yourself. So you say, well, let's see, okay, I could write, I mean, pet death stories. <laughs> Those are always good. I mean, that's standard. You can talk to people in missions. They can maybe give you a list of the top ten. It's like pet death, right? Uh, there's grandparent death. There's like big injury before the big game. <laughs> All right, like a week before the state championships, you know, I'd work the whole, yeah. It's real easy for us to sort of, oh, 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 that's just, that's silly, you know. Because we see the same sorts of things happening because people have a lot in common, right? And there's a way that you, you just wind up, kind of, again, kind of robbing the experience of its uniqueness if you're not careful. This is not, I don't have a conclusion here, do I? Well, let me, yeah, let me say one more thing and then wrap up. Maybe there'll maybe there'll be some theoretical message to all this. Uh, although I think the message is, well, I get to it. All right. Um, well, okay. So, so knowing that this happens, this robbery thing happens. Knowing that you try to do something, or you try to make a statement, or you think something unique's happened to you, and that then it gets absorbed into these conventional stereotype patterns. We work with that. So that's what a lot of Goffman's work is about, is say, you know roughly how people are going to respond if you do X or Y or Z. And so you plan accordingly. Right? And we kind of know what those 
responses are to different things. And we say, oh, if I do this, this will happen. And then you start living your life fitting into those patterns. Hmm, right? Start living your life fitting into those patterns. And using, as we said on the first day, I think, those recipes of how to get the response you want from other people, which is what social roles are all about. That is, I know if I do X and Y and Z, it'll produce this response and that response and that response. The problem, of course, is in doing that, then you give up the possibilities of doing something new or different or creative or fulfilling in some other way, right? And there's, we, you know, because we live with other people, you've got to deal with the reality out there that other people are going to take what you do and use it for their own purposes. I mean, the meanings of what you did. So, so there's no, you know, there's kind of a, a tragic element to that, actually. But Sartre, again, is very cognizant of He's very aware of that problem. He calls it the look, capital L. The look is, is what happens when other people look at you, not just visually. Right? When other people apprehend you, they take you and use you for their own purposes. Right? Okay. So, what we can say then at the end here is the self then includes I'm an object, right? But I'm a subject. But even when I'm a subject, I can be turned back into an object, which is what we were just talking about, right? And that there are at least, yeah, again, these kind of two sides to who I am. There's the, we might say, following George Herbert Mead, who was a philosopher and kind of sociologist in the 1920s and 30s, really, when he did his work. Uh, there's the I and there's the me. Okay? Those words are nice, nice shorthand. The I. I is subject of a sentence. The part of me that does stuff, that can launch things, that has a future, that can change its mind, that can go somewhere new. And there's kind of the me, which is me as object. Uh, oh, nice catch. Right? Me as object. Other people see me, they do things to me, stuff happens to me passively. Okay? Now, hint, if you want to do a little thought exercise. Of course, the problem with this is you've got like subject and object, but they're both nouns. Right? Our language treats us as a noun. That is, you know, Dan is proper noun, that's person, place, or thing. And I'm like, I'm somehow comparable to this. Rather than say, you know, rather than be a noun, you could be a verb. Okay. So when when Emma is dancing, she's Emma in. Right? And anybody you've known who's alive, you watch and you see the way they move and the way they talk, they're alive. That's not just an inert body, like uh, that's a totally different thing. They're doing stuff in the way that they do things. You can imitate the way other people walk and how they move and how they talk, right? That's not hard to do. There's a verbness going on there. It gets left out all the time. If you really want to be tricky with this, of course, try to think of yourself as a preposition. It'd be a serious brain teaser if you want to try it. But you can do it. You can see yourself as a verb pretty easily and a noun very easily. Preposition, tough. Okay? So, for next class, you're going to read a bunch of selections from Oliver Sacks' book, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. Oliver Sacks is, hmm, boy, he's in his 80s by now. Written a ton of stuff. He's a beautiful writer. He's a neurologist. Studies nerve disorders, right? Doctor. Um, and it's a great book. All of his work deals with the relationship between, let's say, the mind and the body. What is the connection? That's what he's about. I think you'll really enjoy it, actually. Thank you. That's it. The, this, oh, the Merleau-Ponty is on your own for fun. It'll take you ten minutes, but it's, I think you'll like it. 
And this one is a recent article by Sachs. It's about music, which actually turns out to be important too.